Hello, and welcome back to Fullerton College's pre-press class. This is Professor Ben Hewitt, and today we're going to talk color management. Our slides are taken from the PIA pre-press trainee manual, and we are looking at section 4.5, which is an intro to color management. Color management, guys, is such a big topic. It could easily be its own class. Wait a minute. We do offer a standalone on this one. It is its own class, but it's also such an important topic that it's a part of several others. Color management is an extremely important topic that helps you produce what it is your clients, and sometimes that's even yourself, are looking for. How to hit the colors as best as possible <clears throat> and as consistently as possible to get pleasing, accurate reproductions in your print jobs. In this module, we're gonna look at what color management does, what, why do we do it? We're gonna talk about a couple of terms because as you all know, printing classes are part language class because you have to learn the language of the industry. We'll be talking about profiles, gamut mapping, lookup tables, ICCs, color sync and C-Lab. That's right, we're gonna revisit C-Lab, my favorite color space. We're also gonna look at the different kinds of software and methods that are used to characterize different devices. And we're also gonna look at how ICC profiles can be used with different software programs. Now, this doesn't necessarily give you a good enough hint of what's coming. And I'll tell you that the final video of this lecture will be an exciting one, at least to me, which is when we get to rendering profiles or rendering intents and ICC profiles, the actual down in the weeds, what is actually happening? What, what are you trying to do with these profiles and how do they uh, carry through on a print job? So color management is simply just a method or a series of methods that you use to get consistent color across various devices. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> Trying to make sure that the digital camera sees the same thing that the human eyeball sees and make sure that the computer carries the same colors through, passes the same colors to a proofer, and that proofer gives an accurate representation of what the actual press is gonna put on the final paper or other substrate. No problem, right? You just have to get like six or seven different manufacturers versions of color separation to all line up and agree. That's easy, right? Oh boy. Anyways, color conversions are made using something called ICC profiles, which we will get to. Here's what color management does not do. Color management is not color correction. Color management does not fix anything. Color management preserves. Whatever you make, if you manage the color correctly, whatever the original image is, the original image will be reproduced pretty much exactly in the final output. If you start with garbage, you're going to end with garbage. Color management will not take that cell phone photo because my cell phone takes great photos and make it print worthy. And it won't take that Photoshop that your cousin did because he's totally good at Photoshop. He saw a tutorial once and has a illegal version of Photoshop on his computer. Yeah, he's totally a designer. Um, it won't make that into a good file either. Color management will take it as it is and put it through to the final thing. This is why I included the, um, I think hilarious Calvin and Hobbes dad explaining color photos uh, comic in this week's uh, sections. So ha ha ha, color photos of a black and white world, right? Well, yeah. So what you're gonna get, if you do proper color management and you do a very good job and someone gives you a bad image to start with, what you're going to get is a very accurate, very faithful, perfect reproduction of an awful image with bad color. But those bad colors will be precisely the kind of bad that they started with, with no alterations. See, that's good color management. The other thing color management does not do is it does not take the place of maintaining your equipment. If you don't maintain your presses and you just let them run all the time and you never clean them and you never recalibrate them, well, those things are going to be running badly. Color management is not there to make bad machines run better. Uh, you need to do that through maintenance and upkeep and calibration. Color management assumes that all those things are working properly. In fact, one of the worst things you can do is color manage so that a badly maintained equipment works where you want it to, because you're going to have to undo all that later. 
Because once that machine finally does reach a breaking point, and it will, when it reaches a point where maintenance must be done, then all that color management you were trying to make an accommodate for a bad press, well, that's all undone. Also, bad presses aren't normally consistent in their errors. They're more wild than what they do. Anyways, moving on. Here's the problem with color. Everyone sees color differently. Every device sees color differently. Here's our favorite covered bridge barn thing that PIA loves to give us. You can definitely see it in the red of that bridge or barn if you just want to call it a barn. And it is a, co a covered bridge, by the way. You can kind of see that it's going over a ravine there. Anyways, that red changes significantly from the four things. The green of the grass and the trees changes significantly between the four squares. The blue sky changes to various levels of blue and grayish blue and purpley blue, depending on which one you're doing. The press, as you can see, has the least vibrant color of all of them. So we need to be able to control so everything will look good when it's compressed down to a smaller gamut. We'll talk about gamuts again in a minute. So we're trying to make everything agree on the same idea, which is like getting people to agree on pizza toppings. Hold on just a moment. Anyway, every device is different. Every camera, every scanner, they all, even with similar or the same model of a CMOS or CCD chip in them, will capture things with slightly different values of the RGB. They'll look at the same picture and see it a little bit differently. The same way two people look at the same thing and see something a little bit different. And then we move on to the displays. No two computer monitors, no two TVs, no two cell phones give you the same exact color from the same RGB numbers. And then each press will also output the CMYK differently, depending on what type of ink it's used, what, how the plate maker's working. There are so many devices in this chain that all need to agree. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. Here are three different RGB devices. They're all using the same color space. What I'm trying to get at here, and what they're trying to get at, is you can't just take for granted that the same color space means they agree. They're speaking the same language, but let's just say there are regional dialectic differences. Kind of how in Spanish, when you go to Cuba, they pronounce things different and even spell them differently to not include some of the letters that they don't pronounce. How if you do English in Scotland, suddenly it's a very different English than you were speaking down in London or, you know, here in California, even within our own country. Down here, you have a grip of things until you pass Bakerfield. Then you have a hell of things. So there's regional differences uh, in language, and there are small language differences in RGB of how they describe the same colors, depending on what device is seeing them. And then the output devices will put them out different. In this case, they're comparing a uh, proofing press to an actual offset litho system. And they both produce similar, not similar, they produce the same part of the image using different values. There's more cyan in the uh, proof one than there is in the output. So traditionally, that meant before any better color management systems came online, within, and this is like case sensitive per print shop, in the shop you had to calibrate the devices to each other. Uh, you do it kind of like tuning a band. You find one instrument, that you kind of trust, you say, well, the piano is the hardest one to tune. So we'll start with the piano and everything else will match the piano. And that's how you tune an orchestra. But uh, anyways, you tune them to each other. You say, okay, this is how this one device is performing. Let's make everything else match that one device. In this case, they're all matching it to the scanner, which to me is silly because the scanner is the least consistent. You should go for the most consistent. You should probably start with the press and see what it does and match everything to it. But the whole idea of doing this is moot anyways. So. Uh, I'm just talking around in circles, aren't I? Anyways, you have to make a proof that's going to go to all look like the same original, and you're going to try to make it so they all look the same from device to device to device. The problem with this is that means you have, in this case, 13 different unique links between them, as every single thing has to match the other devices it interfaces with. And this is a pretty simple system with a single camera, a single scanner, a single computer, a single rip, one press and one proofer. 
really, you're going to have multiple presses in a shop. You're going to have multiple proofers in a shop. You're going to have different uh, types of presses. This is only showing one offset press. What if you're trying to also match to wide format and flexo? Uh, nobody really tries to match to screen. I only knew one guy ever who tried to do that. Uh, he was kind of really cool for actually attempting to color manage a screen printing system. Uh, those are very, very hard to do because there's so many variables. Anyways, the more items you add to this list, the more connections. Any new item you add has to have a, has to be calibrated to every single other item in the shop. And that is rough. Enter the ICC, which by the way, on a side note, has one of the creepiest logos I've ever seen. This is terrifying. <laughs> it's the creepy overwatching eyeball with the colors. It sees all, it knows all. But anyways, sorry, um, being serious again here. The ICC is an industry group that has agreed on color standards. What they've done is set up specifications and uh, charts and numbers that define what colors need to be. Not in some sort of creepy overarching sense, but in a sense that this is a way to make sure that everything agrees. By having agreed upon values, we're able to do this a little bit better. The ICC, if you know, you want to know if somebody means business, um, if, a, if a topic is serious enough, Apple and Microsoft will work on the same team to make something happen. That tells you that this was a serious problem. If they were working together, and I know in the recent years, they've been a little bit less head buddy, but they were bitter rivals. I mean, they were like competing religions when I was a kid. Uh, you, you didn't want to get into that debate <clears throat> between the two. But anyways, if they're working together, you know it's serious. So they work to cooperate to define color specifications and try to create an independent standardized color space, one that was not based off of anybody's machine, one that wasn't leaning towards one device or another, one that was neutral, one that was objective, not subjective. And they used the C-Lab, CIE, L-Star, A-Star, B-Star, color space to do this because as we already talked about, but I can't talk enough about lab color, lab color is not a reproduction model. For every other thing we are talking about so far in this lecture, all those other links, you're talking about linking one device to another and creating this web of calibrations to make sure the scanner sees the same thing as the camera, sees the same thing as the printer, all of that is based off of how do they make color. You're trying to create I mean, if you define your colors as how the scanner sees it, that means everyone is trying to speak RGB in the scanner dialect. If you try to make it so the proofing press is correct, then everything's trying to speak CMYK and the RGB devices are going to patently do a bad job at that because CMYK and RGB rarely agree. So how do you figure this out? You use a color space which favors neither. You use a color space that is simply a map of how humans see color. It could be an objective truth then, or a fact maybe, of what red is. Red will have a certain C, or sorry, LAB value. Instead of, well, you know, it's 100, it's 255R, that's red, or it's, or red is, and that doesn't translate well into CMYK, as you might have seen if you do that in Illustrator you get some weird numbers. You end up with like a 97.3% magenta and a 88.2 yellow and 2% cyan and all this weirdness to try and make RGB red. When red in, our, in CMYK really should be 100 magenta, 100 yellow or close, very, very close to that. But if you choose lab color, they're both aiming at the same target rather than trying to aim at each other. And that is actually a much easier thing to do. I'm gonna pause here. We'll come back to another video in just a bit.